Welcome everybody to the Troubadour podcast. Today I'm going to be reading a very short poem by William Blake called The Claude and the Pebble. And we're going to explore a little bit of the idea of comparisons and what we can learn from poets. So one thing that poets, I think, do more, more better than any other form of artist, I don't care if you're an essayist, um, if you write modern nonfiction books of any kind, of business books, of science books, of you know Malcolm Gladwell type books, of applying scientific theory into the practical world, if you're writing literature in, in terms of novels or short stories, or songs, or pamphlets, or you know uh, educational material in textbooks, I think better than all of them are the poets at doing one thing, comparisons, particularly in a logistic comparisons, analogies, metaphors, similes, images that represent ideas. And we get that a lot with William Blake and really, I mean, really with any great poet. So I shouldn't just say that with, with William Blake, but we're getting that in this poem very clearly. And right at the beginning from the, the name of the, this title, we get the Claude and the Pebble. Now, I've, I'm framing this in that even if, whether you agree with the idea, the generalized idea, the abstraction, the principle, the what he's teasing out of this analogy, what we can learn is how to think analogistically or, or metaphorically. Um, so there's various ways, there's different models of how we can think. And there's a really fun... Um, blog I recommend called farnumstreet.com. And they talk about different models of thinking and how there are different ways of approaching the world. Elon Musk is a big fan of, I think, what he calls first principles thinking. So always go back and ask questions. Why? Why do we do it this way? Why is it done that way? Why is it done? Until you get to a first principle and then you kind of build from there because that's how you question how you do things in the world. You know, why are we doing things this way today? Well, why did we do it that way? What would happen there? And is there any different way? So once you get to the first principle, you can ask, can I build it completely differently? So why do cars look the way they do? Well, let's go all the way back to the drawing board and let's start over. And once we get to first principles, maybe we can say that, you know, maybe cars need to have six wheels and they actually go horizontally rather than vertical. I don't know. You know, I'm just making stuff up as I go. But the idea is that you want to start from scratch and then build up to understand better why that was and what could possibly be improved. That's first principles thinking. Now, metaphorical thinking is much more creative, I think. Whereas you have a kind of linear type of thinking with, which is still very, they're both very important ways of thinking, but with metaphorical thinking, and this is one that if you ever talk to me, I definitely use a lot of analogies and metaphors and sometimes throw out examples that make no sense, but this is just how I think a playful mind works. And, um, you know, a lot of that is learning from just by reading lots and engaging with lots of poetry. So this is one of the secret talents that you get when you read a lot of poetry is that you get this kind of playful use of images of um, talking about and thinking about the world, the ideas, the current events with an example, with an image, with some type of metaphor. And so let me read this very simple poem and we'll talk about the metaphor because I think it'll come out pretty simply once we, uh, once we see it a little bit, let me arrange this. Now, if you're not able to see this, if you're, um, on, uh, what is it? If you're, if you're on, if you're listening rather than uh, hearing this, then go to tubitormag.com and I'll put these, the text up and I'll put the plates. Um, so I'll show you the plate that this is in a second. So you could see what William Blake intended for this. But let me first read it because I think it's such a, an interesting and uh, use of words and metaphors and images to convey a simple idea. Okay, The Clod and the Pebble by William Blake. Love seeketh not itself to please. Sorry, let me start over. This is in quotes. So um, you'll, you'll see in a second, but if you're not watching it, this is sung in quotes. Okay, so let me start over. The, the Clod and the Pebble. Love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself 
hath any care, but for another gives its ease and builds a heaven in hell's despair. So sung a little clod of clay, trotted with the cattle's feet, but a pebble of the brook warbled out these meters meet. Love seeketh only self to please, to bind another to its delight, joys in another's loss of ease, and builds a hell in heaven's despite. Okay, so if you captured in that first reading that there's something about two views of love, then you're a genius. That's good. Uh, Maybe not a genius, but you're very perceptive. So we have a Claude who sings the following. Love seeks, seeketh. Uh, I'm going to kind of just make it more contemporary English. Love seeks not itself to please. So love doesn't seek to please itself. Nor does itself, nor for itself has any care at all. So love doesn't seek to please itself. It doesn't care for itself at all if you're actually in love with someone. But but for another gives its ease. So everything is, if you're really in love with someone, for instance, everything is done to uh, ease that other person and builds a heaven in hell's despair. Now, the question we probably should be asking is, a heaven for who? Because here's the next line, which is not in quotation. So sung a little clod of clay. Well, think about a clod of clay, by the way. It's malleable. It's You can mush it. You can turn it into potter. You can turn it in. You can mold it into anything. So sung a little clod of clay, trodden with the cattle's feet, (laughs) right? So we have this doormat. This first view of um, love is the person, the clod of clay, is a doormat, right? So sure, he's building a heaven and hell's despair for someone else, but they're trampled on. They're a clod of clay. They're molded into something else. So they've their love seeks not it's so love seeks nothing for itself. Love doesn't care anything for itself. Only for another gives its ease and builds a heaven in hell's despair. Probably a heaven for other people. So this is the self-sacrifice premise. I'm gonna of love. I'm gonna sacrifice myself so that you can have heaven on earth while I'm in hell, right? Or at least being trodden by cattle's feet. But a pebble, pebbles hard, smooth surface. But a pebble of the brook warbled out these meters meet. By the way, that is a wonderful little alliteration. These meters meet. Because if you think about verse and what verse is doing is it's meeting, you know, so we have warbled out, which sing. Warbled is what a bird does. It sings. But a pebble of the brook warbled out these meters meet. So it's bringing order to chaos, right? It's bringing from this warbling and we're having harmony meters meeting together right meters meet is a really concise way of describing that that process of th- what this is this this song and what is the hard smooth surface a smooth pebble say love seeks only self to please to bind another to its delight joys in another's loss of ease and builds a hell in heaven's despite. So we're we're having opposing views of what love is. What's the author's view? Does he have a view? Well, here's a hint, because this is in the songs of innocence and experience, showing the two contrary states of the soul. The two contrary states of the soul. William Blake is a dialectician in a sense. So what he believes are the essence of everything and how we interact with the world and come to ideas and come to grow is that you have two, you could think of them as thesis and antithesis. Thesis, antithesis. And they are going through this dialectic process. And in the end, you get a synthesis and you get a new you get a new idea from these two. So these two together, selfless, selfish, is going to form something that actually works together. Now, what are what is his view of that? And you know, would I necessarily agree with it? Probably not. Um, not if you know me and some of the other stuff that I've that I've done. 
I don't think I would agree with his view, and I definitely wouldn't agree with the dialectic process. But we are trying to understand, at least not in in um, a, a the sense that it tends. I think it tends to be taken. But there is something that you can learn a lot from. I think so. One is this is a personification of what most people think of as love. It's either one or the other. It's either the claw to the pebble, right? And this is why it's a, you know, we th think of this as a false dichotomy and there's a problem with it. They said, he's pointing out, by the way, William Blake is saying, you know, by just putting this out there. And so you have the malleable um, clay, clod of clay, which is trodden with cattle's feet. And being trodden in general is not a good thing. And being trodden with cattle's feet is definitely not good. You know, it just pounds you into the earth. So he's not saying that this is good, that this selfless, you know, love seeks not itself to please or, or takes any care of itself. It's, Blake is not saying, yeah, that's good. Let's do that. Right. That's what the religious people might indicate is that, yeah, that's what you want. You want to be selfless. He's saying no, because then you're just a doormat, right? He doesn't say no. He just indicates with the imagery that you're a doormat if you do that, right? You're going to be, you know, so sung a little clod of clay, trodden with the cattle's feet. Now you have a hard surface. So think about a hardened heart, a person who feels nothing, but a pebble of the brook warble. And, and of course, this thing that feels nothing warbles, which is a beautiful, um, you know, way the way that birds sing, warble. warble warbled out these meters meet. Love seek, seeketh only please, self to please, to bind another, to bind, to take another's will and br you know bring it to you, to its delight, to bind another to its delight. So only the selfish person uh, feels delight, you know, in this relationship. Joys in another loss of ease and builds a hell in heaven's despite. Okay, so now we're gonna look at this guy. Now, this is how William Blake uh, wanted you to see this poem. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting image. And, you know, you have one, this harmony between these, I guess, bulls and she or ram, I think. I'm sorry if I'm getting my animals mistaken uh, on the top. And then you have the poem on this little quaint little lake. Um, or maybe swamp, we have a frog leaping out, and you have a duck over here. You know, what is he saying about that? I, you know, honestly, I don't really know, but this is how he wanted to, Sometimes Blake does stuff, and it, you know, I think when you look at them together, it kind of makes a certain kind of sense. I mean, maybe he's saying something like, look at these different types of animals that are peaceful together, and that's kind of the message of the claw to the pebble is that these two ideas are peaceful. Um, or maybe it's just that. Nature is peaceful and in harmony, right? And that's something that maybe nature doesn't even ask these types of questions. I mean, what do you think he's going for with that image? Because that's the image. When you read this, he he doesn't want you to read this poem in the con in the way that I did, which is black text on white background. Like he wants you to read it in the totality of the book that he spent years writing, drawing, and then personally hand coloring each book. So what is he what is he trying to say with this? Now, I, I think you need other poems to get an understanding of what he's trying to say. You can't just do this by itself with the Claude the Pebble. But the last thing, but, but you know, I think it's helpful to look at his way of looking at the world and to show you something. Because what you can get from this poem, very straightforward, very simple, is you have this malleable Claude that views self, that represents, that is selflessness. And then you have the opposite, which is a hard pebble, which is selfishness. So the question is, can there be a third alternative or even a fourth? alternative? Maybe there's a different way of even from what he says. But right now you have these two opposing thesis antithesis, idea one, idea two. Now, and they're now singing to each other. So the question is, will there be a third alternative? And I think we'll see, a, we see a little bit of that in other places. And, you know, he talks about that with, um, the way that the the uh, deities love us, but that is what he's saying in this simple poem. And the most important thing I wanted you to learn from this is this is how poets think. This is how what you know there is a value to thinking in this way, because 
you you really get a sense, you know, if I were to just tell you about selflessness, selfishness, if I just kind of preach at you a selfishness and give you a theoretical understanding of selfishness is this and, and selfishness is giving to your love, you know, uh, everything of, of your, or giving, taking from your love, everything you want. And selflessness is um, giving yourself of everything that you, of, that they want and nothing for yourself. Well, that's, that's great, but it also sticks in your head a little bit more if you have some images that go along with it. And the image of a clod that's kind of trampled on, you know, and cattle kind of stamping on it. And then a hard pebble that feels nothing, nothing gets inside it unless you break it right with a ro- the hammer, but then it's no longer a pebble anymore. It's just like, you know, rocky material. So now, now you have something to see in your eye that represents all the words, thousands of words, millions of words that have been written about selfishness and selflessness and what those are. And um, that can give you a better understanding of what they are. And I think a clod of clay is a good example of selflessness. It's a good image for selflessness. It is like a clod of clay. It's malleable. It means nothing. You know, it it could be molded into anything. And, you know, he has the view of selfishness as a rock. Now, I wouldn't agree with that, but that's his view. And I think that's the cliche view. Now, his, again, I'll I'll just end with this. Remember, the dialectic process. So his view is that these two Ideas are going to class, thesis, antithesis, and then there's going to be a third, a synthesis. What do you think that synthesis is? What do you think is love? Right? Do you think these are good images? Let me know. Thanks for watching. This is The Clod and the Pebble, and I'm um, Kirk Barbera on the Troubadour Podcast. <laughs>